My name is Tamara Russell, and I'm a clinical psychologist, a neuroscientist, and martial artist. And I love to bring together these disciplines to think about ways to support anybody who's a carer to take care of themselves while they're caring for others. So the work that I've been completing over the years has been with doctors, particularly GPs and psychiatrists, also medical students in training, supporting residents during their training and also helping those who work in social care and therapy services. And wounded healers and those who care for others have some particular barriers when it comes to self-care. Uh, often they're the last person in the chain of care because they have so many others to look after not only their patients and those that they are professionally caring for, but then their own family members. And they themselves are often at the end of the line. I've also done quite a bit of work with mums, particularly mums with a postnatal depression or suffering from various kinds of mental ill health, uh, who struggle to care as a result of that and who really must prioritize their own care in order to make sure they can offer their child or their family what's needed. And also working with busy entrepreneurs, particularly women working in the senior leadership space or entrepreneurs setting up new businesses, those women that want to change the world and wanting to make sure that we create businesses, organizations and structures that don't make the same mistakes that we've made in the past. And one of those mistakes I think is that we've made this separation between the care that we give to others and the care that we offer to ourselves as tribes and communities of healers. I've been working over the last few years on something called the Dragon Way to Mental Wealth. And uh, mental wealth to me means the capacity to find access and activate the things that make us feel good, help us to restore and to rest and to make sure that when we're using our attention, our will and our focus, we're doing so in wise ways. Uh, and then that we have the resilience to keep going even when there's challenges and struggles, but we also have the wisdom to know when to ask for help and when to stop. And those last two can be particularly tricky for wounded healers because when they stop, they feel guilty because there's so many people that need their help. And if they have a particularly strong wounded healer story, when they stop, what's actually revealed as well is their own wound. So when I'm teaching on this topic, I often talk about the double layer that the wounded healer needs to tackle. Layer one is that professional layer of what does it mean to stop helping others or to show a weakness in my tribe? Or what does it mean to be a psychologist that has psychological issues themselves that they need, need to deal with? Some of that's bursting this bubble and illusion that every doctor is, is a picture of health or every psychologist is a, is a perfect example of good mental health. I think that's just not realistic. <laughs> it's setting us up for failure. It's a type of idealization that doesn't serve anybody. Now it's true that as healers, as doctors and psychologists, we may have some skills and some language and concepts that ideally we're using for ourselves to stay well. Um, and that gives us a bit of an edge maybe over the, the patients and the clients that we work with, but it doesn't make us infallible, that's for sure. And then the second layer is just all the normal human stuff <laughs> around what does it mean to take care of myself, to prioritize self-care, to say stop to certain activities in order to make sure that we build and, and develop the resource that's needed to go back into the fray and, and go back into the front line, wherever that is in our work. And I work inspired by the trauma focused therapy of Professor Paul Gilbert, and particularly the evolutionary psychology work, which tells us that our brain has three different motivational systems. 
uh, the red, which is the threat mode activated when we are physically unsafe or feeling psychologically unsafe. And that latter one becoming more and more important in cultures, in the workplace particularly. So that's the threat mode. Uh, the blue mode, which is the drive mode. This is when our frontal lobe is activated. We are focusing our attention, directing our will, uh, moving forwards and, and getting things done. Sort of like the to-do list mode, I call this. And then the green mode, which is the rest and restore when the body and the system is doing all the things that it needs to nourish and nurture itself. And at any one time, maybe one of these systems is, is a bit more into the forefront, but certainly in our modern healthcare, um, there's huge amounts of blue um, to the point that actually there's too much blue and we get into the red with burnout and stress and anxiety. But actually in our modern times, we've got just huge amounts of reds, demand, stress, death, new things that we need to deal with, totally brand new situations that we've never come across before, more and more things to do, more and more distress to manage in ourselves and others. And I'm not saying that we can't manage this, I think we can, but this time is inviting us to really think about whether we can dedicate some of the blue towards getting green, because activating this green is what will then give us what we need to manage and face the reds and working with educators and doctors and mums. Often the, the old way was we sort of just go, 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 go until it's time for a holiday and then we collapse. And uh, we, we just collapse for a few weeks and, until we feel better and then we jump back into the fray. Um, teachers particularly may, may resonate with this. They, they wait and wait for the summer holidays and much of the summer holiday is just recovery time. And what I'm interested in, in a systems-based approach is how do we integrate getting into the green in our daily working practices in a way that we can acknowledge that we all have this need to rest and restore. We all have the need to feel psychologically safe and, and as far as possible, physically safe. So how do we create cultures, cultures of care? Uh, whether it's in a business environment, whether it's at the boardroom, whether it's in a classroom or in a therapy setting or in a GP service, how do we create cultures where, yes, we need to be efficient and get the blues done. Yes, we will face challenges and the reds will be there. But how do we kind of up the green and create languages and systems where we can say to one another, uh, there's a red with me right now. My, my red dragon energy is here. My heart is racing. My mind is racing. I can't think straight. I'm disorganized. I'm distracted. Perhaps I've come from a situation at home where I've got a, a relative who's unwell or with COVID or I haven't seen my mom for a year because she's in a home. All of these things of life, which we used to leave at the door, but it becomes increasingly hard to do so. And so let's, let's pop that myth, actually, that we can just leave the stuff at the door and go to work. Many people can. It's something that our brain does extremely well, but it has costs. It has costs and it saps energy. And when we need our energy to use all our amazing mind and brain to work together, to think up new ideas, to innovate, to be creative, to figure out how to face this challenge, then absolutely, let's think, how can we create cultures of care where we can name all of these different dragons? We can name and share the reds when they're at 10% rather than waiting until they're at 100%. We can name and share our incredible cognitive diversity and talk about how our blue, our attention system, our focus, attention, intention, how that manifests in the world in all the beautiful diverse ways that it does in unique human beings, but also recognizing that having this at 100% all the time is not realistic and especially not in these times. And how can we help carers recognize that when they care for themselves, they're actually caring for others. And once I was working with some, some GPs in a, in a project in London, and one of them was a mum, and she gave some feedback. She said, I don't think my kids 
have ever seen me doing self-care. They've seen me caring for my patients. They've seen me working nonstop hours. They've seen me taking care of them, but they've never seen me taking care of myself and taking time for myself. And this opened up a huge discussion because brains learn best through imitation, movement and play. This is the systems we have to, to grow and develop. And we reflected on, on what was that message to her children about what it means to take care of yourself as an adult, as an adult working in healthcare and how many of the messages that she was giving to her kids and to her patients, she was struggling to give to herself. And I think a huge part of that is permission, permission to say it's okay to not be okay. And not being okay doesn't mean necessarily that you have to stop working. Sometimes it does. Sometimes there are ethical and professional levels of uh, awareness there that must be honored. But slowing down and adding some pauses in the day, self-care pauses throughout the day is in, in my experience, a way to ensure that we are managing micro reds and micro moments of challenge rather than letting things build up until we collapse on the floor and then we definitely can't work. So the Dragon Way to Mental Wealth is a preventative health methodology that invites us to get very curious about what gets us into the green. Don't care how you do it. There's tons and tons of research about all the different ways that we can do it. Most important is how do you do it? How is it gonna go into your life? Where is it in your timetable, in your experience, in your family? I can give you a million ways to activate the green mode, to activate the soothing system, to regulate your vagal nerve. I can give you a million ways to do that. But most important is how is it gonna work for you? And to be interested in the blue, your attention. And I love to work with mindfulness, of course, because that gives me a very clear sense of how my attention network is functioning, my capacity to maintain and sustain attention on a topic. I can notice if I'm just got 10% attention or if I'm really firing on all cylinders, I've got 100% attention. Working with doctors, I often talk about that distinction between the attention for technical skills versus the attention needed in the relational dynamic of a consultation, the capacity to switch between these two with intention, with awareness. And for me, mindfulness has been something that has been pivotal in helping with that. And also the ways in which my attention is compromised by the threat system how my attentional system gets compromised when states of high emotion are present uh, and beginning to notice how they emerge in the body, different ways that I can either choose to suppress them or maybe give them a little bit of air just to take some pressure out of the system moment by moment, all the processes that I might need to do as a professional to decompress at the end of the day, healthy ways to decompress and allow my emotions to work through my body. Again, my preferences, I love to work with movement. I love to work with creativity. Uh, I do believe from, from the neuroscience research and what we understand about emotion regulation that these are two really, really helpful ways, but they're not the only ways. And this is what the workshops and the trainings using the Dragon Way to mental wealth are all about. First of all, just introducing some of the key concepts, some psychoeducation around these three systems, some monitoring, some reflection on a typical day, what does it look like? And then a strong invitation to look for places where you can amplify greens or up the number of moments where you're adding rest and restore. And I've got some many, many techniques that I've been training doctors and nurses and students with over the last 10 years or so. Um, and delighted to share those with, with anybody that is, has got the time to, to drop into this. Um, but they're very practical, real world, recognizing that this isn't about sitting on a cushion and navel gazing and 
you know, focusing on whatever. It's, it's real world stuff that you can start doing now. Uh, absolutely, it gets easier with practice. Absolutely, it gets easier if you've got good introspective skills and a, and a highly honed and trained attention, of course. But the first point is to really recognize that we suffer and we're challenged as healthcare workers, as wounded healers particularly. Uh, our strength is our weakness, our weakness is our strength. And my passion, my work is how do we have these conversations in new ways so that we can move forward and through the challenges that we face together now and create healthcare systems that care for everybody in them and recognize that everybody in them needs care, particularly that psychological safety. Working with big business, we know the data. Organizations with high psychological safety are more efficient, more productive, and have more innovation. Uh, huge studies from, from Google demonstrating that when we get psychological safety right, everything that flows from that is, is different and better. Thank you.